And with that, I'm happy to present <laughs> Mitch Anstey, who is also from Sandia National Labs. Hi, everyone. My name is Mitch. Um, I am, as Rick said, a uh, scientist at Sandia National Labs. Um, I got my PhD in chemistry at Berkeley, um, doing basically nothing like what I'm going to talk about here today. Um, pretty much everything I'm going to talk about is something I've learned in the past week, or it's actually something that I learned um, over the past three years of working at Sandia, where I've, I've really tried to expand and learn something new and very cool. Um, and so this, new, this job has actually allowed me to do that, which um, good luck to all you budding graduate students out there. Um, it's tough. Um, so uh, my talk is about luminescence and all the different ways that we can make light with different compounds. But so luminescence is, you know, the definition is uh, emission of light from a material, an atom, a molecule, um, upon some stimulus. You, you have to put energy in to get energy out. That's really how, how everything works. Um, but the one stipulation with luminescence is that it can't be heat. It can be just about anything else. It can be, um, uh, whoops, I mean, it can be another photon of light to then give energy to a, a, a compound, and then you get that photon right back out, uh, maybe at a different wavelength. Um, you can do electricity. You can use radiation. Um, so that's part of what we do at Sandia, um, using luminescent compounds to let us know whether there's uh, a dangerous nuclear weapon nearby or a dangerous chemical or biological weapon nearby. So that's what myself and, uh, and a couple other people in the audience actually do. Um, but so even living organisms, and you've probably seen tons of those examples. Um, so, you know, I, I think I've already said this slide, but it's the idea is energy in and energy out, just not heat as that energy in. Um, you start off with some compound A. You know, A represents an atom. It can represent uh, a big solid. Um, it can re represent an LED uh, LED light bulb. Um, but you put you give energy to it, and then it goes into this excited state. So it's now itself plus that extra little bit of energy that you've given it. What you've done in this instance, though, is given that compound some extra energy in its electronics, in the electronic state. So electronic, I'm actually talking about electrons, electrons, protons, neutrons, and that this electron is now further away from its positive charge. Um, obviously, positive and negative, they attract one another. They want to be closer. And so it finds a way to then give that energy back to pull that negative charge right back towards wherever that positive charge happens to be and eject another photon of light. So this can be a photon. This can be you know, a mechanical force. It can be some chemical reaction. But in the end, you move this, you move electrons around, and you get your light right back out. So, again, incandescence is heat. So, team incandescent, they've got some pretty cool people on their squad. They've got molten lava, okay, big deal. Um, they've, got, they've got fire, um, I mean, but like an incandescent light bulb, nobody even uses those anymore. Um, but the sun, okay, giver of all life, got to give some props to that. But on Team Luminescence, we've got black lights, way better than incandescent. <laughs> um, like th these are selling like all over the place in Colorado and Oregon right now. <laughs> Everybody's got to have a black light. Um, uh, we've got lasers. We can do laser light shows. They can't do that. Um, where they have the sun. Uh, we have Cyclops. That is bioluminescence to the max. I mean, this guy shoots lasers out of his eyes. That is the epitome of luminescence and bioluminescence. And forget Avatar, I will always go, go for Cyclops. So um, back to luminescence. Um, you know, everyone wants to be an expert in a field. Um, and sometimes it's really hard to be an expert in a really big field, so we kind of chop it up. You know, like, it's kind of hard to be into all alcohol. So now you've got to be like, oh, I'm a mixologist. 
are like, oh, I'm really into venology, or I brew my own beer now. Um, so it kind of happens with, <laughs> so that kind of happens with luminescence too. That that people have differentiated this entire field of luminescence by all the inputs. What are what are these energy inputs that you can do? So. A lot of the names are pretty self-explanatory. You've got mechanoluminescence for mechanical work, mechanical force. You've got bioluminescence for biological organisms, uh, radioluminescence for radiological, um, sorry, for uh, radiation. Um, and so because there are so many, I, I can't really talk about I intended to. And then I started making the talk, and I realized I only have 15 minutes. So I concentrated on the ones that I thought were um, really cool to demonstrate to you guys. Um, obviously, I'm not going to do radiation here. Um, so what I decided to do, so I, I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We all want to be a cyclops, but it can't happen that quickly. Some have to die. Um, um, so... <laughs> wow. wow, that was not a planned joke. That was like all ad lib. Um, so... I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show photoluminescence, I'm going to show mechanoluminescence, and then I'm going to show chemiluminescence right at the end. So photoluminescence, you see this all the time, every single day of your lives. Every time you look at a piece of white fabric, you look at a piece of paper, uh, a notebook paper, any sort of white paper, um, even cosmetics, um, that these compounds are in uh, cosmetics basically. So again, Photoluminescence is light in, is absorbed into the electronic state of a compound, and then it's, re, it's emitted again with a slight change in the wavelength um, based on some energy loss um, to do these electronic transitions. So, um, uh, so a lot of the compounds that you'll find, these fluorescent compounds in laundry detergent, paper, whatever, they'll convert this invisible UV light, the light that is just outside the visible spectrum, and they'll convert it into blue light, light that we can see, essentially giving an optical illusion that all of a sudden it's glowing. You, you don't, the light that is being put around doesn't add up for your eyes as to what is coming out back at you. Um, and so, uh, and in addition to that, blue light is best for this because in a lot of these, these are natural, these are natural fibers. You can only bleach things but so much before they're just not useful for their intended purpose. So you counteract, you balance that little bit of yellow with a little bit of blue to make it perfectly bright white. Um, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, um, let me see. So, and, and going back to cosmetics, so you'll see a lot of fluorescent compounds like this in cosmetics, um, in compounds, or uh, sorry, in cosmetics that hide age spots or dark lines or shadowy eyes or, you know, I don't know, those sorts of things. Because what it actually does is it takes that UV light, especially if you're outside, it takes that UV light that hits these spaces, like maybe under your eyes or, or a dark area, and it'll actually make it glow all of a sudden. So it's really just a, an aesthetic thing, but it's chemistry and photoluminescence working in your favor, I suppose. Um, so uh, again, electromagnetic magnetic spectrum uh, just outside the visible and emits it back in the blue, making it appear as if it's going to glow. So um, you know, here is w a picture of one molecule, Brightener 28. Um, it's common in detergents and t-shirts. Um, that's why, you know, when, when me and my rage crew were hanging out, uh, these guys, like, you know, all of, all of a sudden our shirts were glowing blue. Um, uh, but, but also, um, so it's in sunscreen as well. So sunscreen, you know, the best way to protect your skin from UV light is to, is to put a layer of compound that absorbs the UV light so it actually gets in between that UV light and your skin so it doesn't damage your DNA or... or or give you a sunburn. Um, and also, in, it's, uh, quinine is a compound in tonic water, but um, it's not there because it's fluorescent. It, that's not the intended purpose, although it is a very cool effect. Um, it, this actually just has medicinal purposes and happens to be fluorescent. So actually, Rick, if you could come and uh, actually bring a gin and tonic for us, because I have to say I'm awfully thirsty all of a sudden. Um, and uh, 
So if I just put this black light right here, and I warn you that Dale gives heavy pours. Oh. It's like that much gin. Well, that's good for you because I didn't pay for it. So, well, first off, So that's one form of photoluminescence. Fluorescence and phosphorescence are both photoluminescence. Um, but then also you can see, um, oh, you can kind of see it, but let's do it. So that doesn't work so well. But so here's just a bottle of quinine that I purchased, you know, from Safeway, whatever. And so this is really, you know, you would say that that looks colorless. There's nothing in it. But when you hold the black light, so this is actually giving out a lot of UV radiation. Um, uh, and exciting it and then transferring it into the blue. And also, what did I do with this? So laundry detergent, it looks, laundry detergent looks just like it, you know, like my lab coat does. Um, you can see his totally awesome glow in the dark skeleton of a bunny. So, um, so those are all just, you know, even these compounds aren't meant to be fluorescent, but they do. Um, well, they're meant to be, but I didn't want them to be right now. <laughs> um, yeah. Now everything's dark and I can't see. Okay, so yeah, so so those are just a couple of small examples of of photoluminescence, the the process that um, converts light into uh, another wavelength of light. So. <laughs> So, oh, the joke is revealed. I didn't even say it yet. Um, so actually, so going back to that compound avabenzone, so in sunscreen, what it, it actually does a really good job of absorbing. It doesn't do such a good job of re-emitting that light. So that first A to A star, it does a good job. So I actually covered this piece of glass with, um, with uh, sunscreen, and admittedly not a whole lot, but there's really no, no blue color, no, no uh, re-emission out. Um, but you can play certain tricks with some of these compounds where you can add a secondary emitter. You can have A star hand off all this extra energy to something that does a better job of re-emitting it at another wavelength. And so, um, in fact, with that specific compound, or actually one very much like it, called, um, so, avabenzone, if you put a europium atom next to that chemical compound and you make one molecule out of it, you suddenly get a really intense, so this compound, you know what, that's, that's kind of yellow, right? So it's just a yellow compound. This is avabenzone with europium atom next to it. And if I hit it with a really intense source of UV light, you see the emission of europium. <laughs> Thank you for that hoot. That really makes you feel good. Yeah, yeah so, so what you're actually seeing now is not blue light, but actually the red light from europium, and europium is a, a lanthanide atom, uh, just an element in the periodic table, and actually the lanthanides end up having this really neat property of, of giving out light, and actually giving out light in all different wavelengths. So terbium, which you probably never heard of, is green. Um, dysprosium gives, I think, kind of like a purpley color. Um, and some actually emit out all in the, in the infrared, so you can take a photon at 300 nanometers of light, so outside the visible, and then re-emit it all the way out at 1,500 nanometers. So um, that's part of the research that I, I'm actually working on at Sandia. But um, I didn't actually bring this compound because it's phosphor, well, it's because it's photoluminescent. Um, it actually has another very cool property, um, and that is mechanoluminescence. So Rick, could you start distributing these for me? So I'm, what I'm passing around now is just a, a couple. So it's some of that compound inside of a, a, a plastic baggie. And then it's got two, um, it's sandwiched between two glass slides. So if you, so I'll, I'll explain in a little while. But if you just very lightly press the two glass slides together, you'll see a little flash of that red light. So make sure to pass it around, get everyone around you to see it. It's hard to see. It's a very, it's a very 
you know, dim light, but uh, you can actually see it. All right, and then after the talk, please go ahead and bring it up when you're done. Um, <laughs> please don't eat it. Although europium isn't that dangerous, though. But <laughs> with a name like europium, how can you go wrong? Um, so mechanoluminescence. So uh, mechanoluminescence is the is the uh, luminescence that results from a mechanical force on a compound. And actually, this compound has to be at least in the at least in the case that that you're seeing right now. It's a crystal. Um, so I came up with a with kind of an analogy for this. That so imagine you know Mike Tyson. He's totally ripped, perfect human specimen. He's really strong. You're not going to beat him. But all of a sudden, you know, you get like uh, a left hook, you knock him out, you break his teeth, and he's really, really pissed. <laughs> so that's mechanical force, energy in. You've, you've excited him. So now you have Mike Tyson with a little star like I had before. So Tyson, Tyson star. And the only way that he's not going to be mad at you anymore is if he emits a photon of light. All right, so that's not actually a good analogy, um, but but the idea is there. That so you have this perfect crystal, this crystalline compound, and in, in, um, in among all solids, uh, a crystal tends to be the most stable of the solid uh, of of the solid um, uh, compositions. Thanks, Joe. Um, and so. If you disturb that crystalline lattice, there's the possibility that you either break a chemical bond or you actually separate charge, kind of like you were doing with light, that you're actually changing the electronic structure. So separating charge um, is an uphill in the potential energy scheme. So if you, put, if you put a crack inside this perfect crystal and now your negative and positive charges end up being opposite one another, the crystal will find a way, either it puts a spark across a gap or the electrons migrate or, or however it might work, but they'll find a way to neutralize that or to bring down that, that high energy state that you've put in with your mechanical force. And some compounds, like mechanoluminescent compounds, like the one that you're, you're holding now, they'll emit light as that way of getting rid of that energy. Most of the time it would just be heat. It would just kind of bump around with the uh, molecules around in the atmosphere. But in this case, you're going to give off a photon. And in the case of this europium compound, you're going to give off a photon about 620 nanometers, so a red light, and that's and like a red-orange light. So um, you know, other examples that you can see this, you can drop a pumpkin from like a second-story building in the dark, and you should see triboluminescence, so a, a, a version of mechanoluminescence. Um, if you go into your bathroom and you have a, a wintergreen crystal and you bite down on it, um, with, with your mouth open, of course, you can't see into your mouth. Um, you should see um, uh, the sugar crystal, so the, you should see a little flash of, like, I think, green light. Um, and that is a sugar crystal cracking, but it doesn't, it doesn't emit a photon. It transfers its energy to the, the winter green oil that is in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the breath mint. And then that emits the photon for it, similar to, to the europium atom transferring at energy. So all, it's, it's all around us, and sometimes you just have to do weird stuff like biting wintergreen crystals in your bathroom with the lights out. Um, so this part is where you are still doing that. Um, is everyone actually, so if you have done this, have you been able to actually see the light? OK, cool. <laughs> see the light. All right, well, hopefully we're going to see a lot more light in a second. So chemiluminescence. So as a chemist, I saved chemiluminescence for last. Um, uh, chemi energy can be stored in chemical bonds, uh, um, uh, in, in chemical compounds. And uh, um, if you allow, so say, if you allow chemical chemicals to react and they form new bonds and break old bonds, Sometimes that, en that energy doesn't all add up, and you have some left over, and maybe you need a little bit extra. In the case of a chemiluminescent reaction, that leftover energy that you would normally see as just kind of the solution heating up a little bit um, is actually, instead of giving off as heat, it's giving off, given off as a photon of light. Um, so uh, 
you know, you see this in glow sticks. Um, in fact, I, I sort of, uh, I, I view bioluminescence as a, a category of chemiluminescence. It's a chemical reaction that's occurring, but just inside a, a biological organism. So, sorry if that offends some biology people in the audience. But uh, I, I, um, it's just biology can do a much better and more elegant job than any chemist can. So I'll give that little olive branch to you there. <laughs> um, so let's see. So, so now it's time for the actual uh, chemiluminescence. So the, the actual compound that I'm going, the two compounds, the important ones I'm going to react are this one here called leucigenin. And uh, it's going to react with uh, hydrogen peroxide. And that hydrogen peroxide is going to cleave this poor molecule into two. But it's going to end up with one of these molecules actually having a little bit extra energy. And a little bit extra energy in that electronic state. That those electrons aren't all situated in their most stable form where they want to be. And so the best way to do, to get back into that really stable state, is to just emit a photon of light. Um, and in this case, it, it's going to be a photon of blue light. So, <laughs> all right. So with that, oh, yeah, I'll just talk real loud. So, uh, as with all good chemical <laughs> reactions, oh, good point. Um, what you need to do is wear your PPE, personal protective equipment. <laughs> 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 I only splash a little bit. Jeez. <laughs> so, um, so I've got one solution of leucigenin, and that is actually that is that is this compound here. It's the, the sort of already fluorescent green color. Um, and I've got my solution of hydrogen peroxide. Oh man, my tonic. Shoot. Oh, man. Um, and so, uh, if, can I get these two lights here turned off? Or yeah, I, I think I think it should be okay. I just want to make sure everyone can see, because it is sort of it's somewhat subtle, but it's uh, it's still awfully cool. So first, I'm just going to mix leucigenin and hydrogen peroxide. All right, here we go. Hopefully this works. <laughs> so this is a chemical reaction, so it's going to take some time to react. Um, and so that, um, but eventually all the, the re starting materials are going to get consumed. And you're going to only see, let me see. Um, and then eventually the reaction will stop once all those energetic. Oh. <laughs> um, so the the light's going to go out. Um, <laughs> I know it's very sad. I know, but uh, let's see. So so I'll, I'll mix this one up first. But then the other thing I'd like to do. So in this one, I am going to now let's see, mix. So now I'm going to take, uh, do another thing where I add a secondary fluorophore, uh, a, a secondary emitter. Um, and hopefully, you'll see a color change. So first, I do this. I'm going to add this, and hopefully, maybe maybe there's a color change, maybe not. So I haven't actually changed the chemical reaction. All I've done is added a different compound that emits at a different wavelength. That molecule that had all that energy, it actually just bumped it over to the next molecule, and it now gives off another, another photon of light. And so I could probably even do it. I'm going to do it with this one too, so it's starting to go out, but, yeah. 
All right, what the hell? Let's do it all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so. So, that is the conclusion of the chemiluminescence demonstration and the conclusion of my talk. So, thanks everyone. I hope you liked it. And I will take any questions you might have. Uh, yep, yeah. question over there. Why is heat not allowed? Repeat the question. So, why is heat not allowed? And I'm guessing you mean uh, as the energy input. Um, so, that's a good question. It's uh, so heat. So, when heat is applied and, and you see light, that's the that's a, a form of black body radiation. If you've taken plenty of, of physics or science courses like that, that um, the uh, that heat will basically make any compound on the planet, as long as it doesn't do some sort of chemical reaction, it will make light. And it's not necessarily that it's an electronic structure, that you're not really moving electrons around to achieve this process. That it just so that you're putting enough energy in that, that you're getting uh, this reflection of um, high energy radiation. And as you turn up the heat, as you go, so I think 798 Kelvin is the temperature. It's called the Draper point, where almost any compound like graphite, you know, rocks, dirt, that sort of stuff, is suddenly going to start to glow red. Um, and as you apply more heat, it you know moves further into the visible visible spectrum. Um, but in the case of luminescence, you're specifically exciting some electronic transition, not just reflecting um, uh, indiscriminate. Uh, electromagnetic waves. So, hopefully that hopefully that answers it. Uh, yep. Okay. So how 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 one of your slides said like 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 chemiluminescence is like how, like for example the optical brightener reacts to like most laundry detergents. No, and sunscreen. Now what about like say a UV absorber you use in an automotive clear coat? Is that also going to be like like chemically luminescent in that sense or not really? Okay, so the, the question was, um, what if there's a UV clear coat on the, the window of your car? Is no, it? Like a clear coat on your car's body. Like oh, okay, to protect the paint, I guess? Yeah. So I think that works more like the sunscreen example, that it doesn't necessarily emit. What it's really doing is just, um, it's, it's still sort of similar to Ava Benzone, potentially. I, I don't really know, so don't quote me on that. But the idea is that it will absorb that, elect that UV radiation and either reflect it back or turn it into heat or do some other process that doesn't allow it to penetrate into your paint and then cause your paint to photo bleach or you know, whatever process it does. But yeah, so it, it's similar. So that's photoluminescence, not chemiluminescence. Okay. Yeah. So glow sticks. So um, glow sticks are chemiluminescent reactions. Um, in the case of glow sticks, so what I've shown is maybe a, a, a more general um, and easy to perform reaction, um, similar to how you might do luminol. But in the case of um, glow sticks, it's just a different chemical compound. In fact, I think from what I remember, it is it's still hydrogen peroxide. So again, glow sticks are a sort of a tube within a tube. That that's how they've separated the reagents. I've just had to put them in two different, you know, vials. But um, you then crack that tube, you mix the reagents, and the hydrogen peroxide reacts with a molecule typically called TCPO, um, which I, I actually I forget what the chemical compound actually is. But you then have um, a second. You then have the secondary emitter that kind of like when I added in that yellow compound that gave out the light, um, and then. They'll usually use that same mixture and then just change the color of the plastic coating to make you think that you're getting different colors. But actually, it's just it's just the changing, the mixing of different colors to make um, to keep things cheap and to produce more. Um, but that's sort of the general principle, similar to how I added hydrogen peroxide uh, to my molecules. Yep.
I, I would have to say no. I, I, oh, so the, the question was, um, can you have an endothermic or um, uh, energy wanting reaction, or an, a reaction that ends up sucking energy from the, the surrounding uh, solution um, also give off light? And I don't think that's the case because what you, uh, um, I guess I'd rather not paint myself into a corner, but I don't think, I don't think that's true, but I, I could see, um, because what you're actually looking at is the electronic structure that results from the, tip of the type of cleavage that you would be doing. You know, so you're cleaving that leucinogen into one half, depending on where the electrons end up, that gives you the light out. But there could be, it could still be, yeah. Good question. Okay, good question. I, I would probably consider myself one of those, but yeah. <laughs> but that's okay, you insulted me and I'll, I'll take it. I've got my gin and tonic still. Uh, more go right there? Very good question. So his question was, um, does the color of the emission, so maybe in the, in the context of the europium? Exactly. So um, again, just so you guys can hear, does the wavelength of the emission change upon the oxidation state change of the metal atom? So um, yes, it does. It certainly does. So in the case, uh, actually in the case of europium, if you have europium-3, you're going to see that red color. Um, you can, you can uh, reduce that compound europium-2, and you actually get um, not only a change in the fact that it, that is a, actually a phosphorescent reaction, a uh, phosphorescent emission, we actually make it fluorescent upon changing it to europium-2, and it's actually a, a, a blue emission. Um, am I right, Patrick? Blue? Awesome. Yeah, so exactly, because when you change your oxidation state, you're actually changing the number of electrons that are surrounding that atom. And so you're, you're changing the electronic state of the atom, and as I said, this is all resulting from what the electronic state of the atom is in the first place. So if you put in or take out electrons, you're definitely going to be changing which electrons are doing all the movement. Um, sometimes it might not even be uh, uh, luminescent in the first place. So uh, I think, you know, so cerium-3 has one electron in its valence, and so you're going to move that around. You, if you oxidize it, the cerium-4, it has no more um, accessible electrons, in, at least to excite in the visible re region, so it's no longer luminescent, at least in the visible region. Yep? Why do your teeth glow in the black light? Uh, that's a good question. Um, why, why do your teeth glow um, in a black light? Um, I actually don't know. I, I could hazard a guess that maybe there's a fluorescent compound in the toothpaste and that you're just applying it to your teeth. Um, but I, but you know, there are plenty of, of actual, of, of rocks and minerals that are also fluorescent and phosphorescent. So I don't want to discount that as well. But that's a really good question. I, I don't know. But I, I might think that it's all the tooth, big toothpaste out there watching over us all. Um, but I don't know. <laughs>